Okay, um, we can go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Michelle Darian and I'm a registered dietitian at Inside Tracker. Today I'm joined by Dr. Nir Barzilai. We're so excited to talk to you today. Nice being with you. Great, I can go ahead and introduce you. So um, Dr. Nir Barzilai is the director of the Institute for Aging Research at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, the director of the Paul F. Glenn Center for the Biology of Human Aging Research and of the NIH Nathan Schock Centers of Excellence in the Basic Biology of Aging. He's a professor in the Departments of Medicine and Genetics and a member of the Diabetes Research Center and of the Divisions of Endocrinology and Diabetes and Geriatrics. Dr. Nir Barzilai's life work is tackling the challenges of aging to delay and prevent the onset of all age-related diseases, including the big four, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and Alzheimer's. In June 2020, Dr. Barzilai released his book, Age Later. Today, we had hundreds of questions submitted to Dr. Barzilai about his book and about his research in longevity, which we're looking forward to discussing today. Okay, we can go ahead and dive right in. So, thank you for the introduction. All, all I heard is how old I am, right? If you <laughs> stick around, then you get this CV built. <laughs> I think it's how, how excellent you are. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so the first question um, that we got was about um, a little bit about genetics and how that contributes to aging. Um, so in Age Later, you discussed your findings from the Longevity Genes Project. Your team conducted genetic research on centenarians and their children. And in your book, you mentioned that you were quite surprised by what you found. Can you describe a little bit about the contribution of genetics to aging and how that might differ between different people? Oh, uh, uh, absolutely. And it's very important. And let, let me just start. If this was the board of geriatrics, okay, and that was the question, what's, what's the ratio between uh, environment and genes? The correct answer would be 80% environment and 20% genes. And for many of you, you might think, okay, 80% go this part of the room and the 20% goes there. I'll give you an example why the 80-20 cannot really be determined but, but really to tell you, this is an interaction between the environment and genes. That's, that's what we do now. And let's say that it's true. Let's say that 20% is genetics. If we could understand what's the 20% genetics, we could protect this interaction with 80% environment, okay? So it really, it really doesn't, doesn't matter, um, but, with centenarians, I think it's the other way around. It's 80% genes and 20% uh, environment. So why is their aging slow? What is their genetics that we can develop drug? That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, very interesting. And then were there any, so you said that centenarians were, um, it's almost kind of that, that opposite split. So that 80-20, are there um, any specific genes or anything specifically that you found in that project that um, kind of leads to that switch? Uh, uh, absolutely. We found common genes and we found rare variants, like let's call them mutations uh, that happen in them. And in fact, two of those common variants have been already developed into drugs. Uh, just, just to make, make the point, you know, people are saying, oh, well, it's genetics. So if I don't have the genetics, that's it. No, in fact, those who have the genetics, that's what they have. The drugs are designed for the people who don't have the, the genetics. But as an example, I'll tell you that 60% of the centenarians have some abnormality in the function of growth hormones. And, and there's one growth hormone, but there are many growth hormones. There's one hormone that's called growth hormone, but there are many growth hormones. And, and, and as I said, it, it, the majority of centenarians have that. And it made sense to us because uh, the dwarf animals, you know, if it's, if it's the small dogs that live longer or the ponies that live longer, or, or if, you, if we mutate growth hormone in the lab or have dwarf models, they always live longer. And the reason is because at some point you have to stop growing and protect yourself against the aging. You have to shift this energy from growth to protecting against the breakdown. And so when you have low growth hormone, you're achieving a lot of that and longevity. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I think 
Um, it's interesting that that kind of like the size kind of, or how like the growth hormone contributes to that and how that can be used, even just like how we're, um, how we're growing and developing and how that contributes to almost how we're aging too. Um, well, but, but I, I have to tell you just one caveat. Yeah. The bigger the animal, okay, the bigger the animal, like whales and elephant, okay, they've, they're, they're bigger, they have high, high growth hormone and they live longer. But within every species, if you start de deleting this growth hormone, you actually would live longer. Okay, so it's, it's a little complex relationship because that's what people say, hey, what about whales? What about elephants? Yeah, but if you decrease the growth hormone in every species, you're actually going to get longevity. Wow. Yeah, that's really interesting that it kind of applies across the board, or yeah, with larger animals that it also applies. So that's really interesting. Um, so, in, so you mentioned a little bit about how um, some, sometimes the lifestyle factors are contributing to how those genetics are kind of playing out. Um, and in your book, um, you basically, one of the things that you described um, was something about something called super agers. Um, so that was kind of, I think what you used to describe different centenarians. Um, and I thought it was really interesting that you pointed out that some of these centenarians, they were typically ill for only five to eight months um, of their lives prior to passing. Um, and that's kind of compared to the average that we see as more like five to eight years in the average person. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering what specific lifestyle factors or any sort of factors can contribute to kind of keeping those last few years as healthier years. So, so two things. First of all, you described it absolutely right. We call it contraction of morbidity. Okay, you're sick less at the end of, the, of, of, of your life. And so our centenarians live longer, live healthier for long. It's not that they get disease when everybody gets disease and now they're they're sick. They live a uh, uh, they live healthier and they're sick at a very small time at the end of their life. And it's important because even the CDC, now we all know what's the CDC in the last three years, showed that the medical, the, the um, medical cost in the last two years of life of somebody who dies over the age of 100 is third of those who die at, at 70. So we call it a longevity dividend. It's not only that, if you're not in the hospital, what are you doing? You're traveling, you're buying, you're shopping for your kids. So, so it's real. Um, but, but, um, but then you actually, okay, so this is true. And then you ask me something else <laughs> at oh, the yeah. end. Yeah, so I was wondering if there's any specific lifestyle factors or anything. No, okay, so how is it correct? Okay, so look, I, I want you to hear very well what I'm saying. Centenarians, like 60% were smokers and less than 50% exercised and 50% were obese or overweight because they had genes that didn't matter. You know, I have, I have a woman who smoked for 95 years, okay? So, you know, if you smoke for 95 years, you live long life, right? But, <laughs> but she, she could do it because she was uh, protected. By the way, she's you know, I have a story where in my book, Helen, and when I saw her, she was 100 years old, um, and she opened the door in a Manhattan apartment, and she was smoking, and I said, <laughs> Helen, nobody told you to stop smoking, and she said, you know, all the four doctors that told me to stop smoking, they died, okay, <laughs> but the point is, for the centenarians, they didn't do what we know we should do. What we should do is we should exercise, right? We should diet or, or you know, certainly not be obese. Uh, we should sleep. We should be in a better mood. There are other things that we have to do and we should do, and they're good for the centenarians. It didn't matter. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that um, it's like lifestyle factors like do play a role in, with, for so many people, but sometimes if, if someone has great genetics, then it sounds like, um, it sounds like that was working well for them. So that totally makes sense. Right. Uh, and, and, they're, and they're one of 10,000. So, you know, don't, right. don't count, count on them. I, I once gave an interview in television and went out uh, to, to pick coffee and, and somebody said, I, did I see your interview? I said, yes. He said, I was in the gym and I realized my grandmother is 102. So I don't need to exercise ever <laughs> again. No, that's not the lesson. <laughs> Yeah, you're like, it's not the lesson, but it's good to have that. It's good to have that kind of, those kind of genes on your side too. Um, right. 
So it's interesting. So you mentioned a few um, of the different factors that we're kind of we're used to hearing about um, contributing to aging. So things like nutrition and proper diet, um, exercise, and and potentially genetics as well. Um, I thought it was really interesting that the number four um, lifestyle factor that you mentioned in your book was actually optimism. Um, so you talked about how uh, optimism and a, having a positive attitude um, can contribute to, or can be one of those factors that's kind of common among those centenarians. Um, I'm wondering if you have any hypotheses on why that might be the case. Is that something that's more scientific? Like, is that a specific pathway or is that just kind of um, someone's aura or something about them? Or what do you think? So I think I was wrong in my book. And let, let me give you an example. I met a 104 year old guy and he's <laughs> the loveliest guy that I've ever met. Okay. Optimistic, super nice not a bad word about his daughter-in-law, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And I, you know, it was just, just a delight. And with this, you know, with this really positive personality. And then I go out of the room and I bump into his son. Mm -hmm. He's 82 years old. Okay. And I tell the son what I just told you, you know, this, your father is just, Amazing. And, and so he looks at me and says, you should have seen the son of a bitch when he was my age. He was a terrible, terrible person. And, and so what we realized is that, yeah, what we described about centenarians is true. But when we say that personality doesn't change, it was, you know, people who looked at it until age 60, maybe 70. But think of that. Beside the fact that the brain is aging, those guys have lost, you know, have retired, lost spouse, moved from one place, moved to another place, are in old age home. So there's a lot of thing that makes them who they are only at that age. And, and, and by the way, it's supported by study. When, when you take young and old people and show them slides, some slides are really good, like islands in the Caribbean or in Hawaii. And some are bad, like cockroaches in pizzas, crawling in pizzas. And then you ask them to recall. The young people recall a lot, and from both groups, the old people recall the good things. <laughs> so there's something in the brain, I'm, I'm looking forward to that, something in our brain that kind of uh, helps us with ignoring the bad things, and maybe that's how we become this better and optimistic personality by just, you know, Never mind the bad things. Yeah, that's super interesting. It's like if there's a way to kind of maybe shift our focus from some of those things that were uh, maybe less ideal over to some of those things that are more positive. Um, that's, yeah, that's super interesting. Um, kind of thinking about how the brain, the brain and all of that too. Um, so I'm curious, did you find that some of the super agers had, were able to maintain some of that mental sharpness um, as they were aging? A, a lot of them, a lot of them. And, and I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story, not in my book. My, my father-in-law is the son of a center. His mother died at 102. Her father died at 102. Unfortunately, he died at 92 uh, now. It's, so he still lived 15 years above life expectancy. Um, but uh, he, like some others came to our study, we have a study that we're looking at the offspring and what happened to them, you know, and if are they optimistic and staying that way or are they becoming optimistic, all the things that we discussed before. And he, every time when we do all those, those tests that are cognitive tests, he scores better for 15 years, every time he scores better. Um, and we're not expecting older to do better. We're expecting them either you deteriorate faster or deteriorate slow. So what was his secret? Uh, I'll give you an example, but there, there are many tests. So there are many examples. But one of the tests is you have one minute to say all the fruits and vegetables you can remember. So he would go and prepare it. He would go to the vegetable market and he would stand and look, first of all, from left to right and say loud the fruits and the vegetables. And then he'll close his eyes and, and stuff like that. So he practiced. And every yeah. time he got more fruits, in fact, he, get, he got names of fruits and vegetables that the testers didn't know. They thought maybe he's <laughs> demented because he's inventing something, but he wasn't. <laughs> uh, so, uh, 
so yes, the cognitive resilience is really part of this longevity because look, it's the biology of aging in all our organs and that's what drives the disease. So which disease you're going to get first depends on many things. You know, if your mother is diabetic and you're obese, you're going to get diabetes, okay? But, but, uh, but basically, if you have this propensity for, uh, for longevity, for slowing aging, you'll be doing better everywhere. Yeah, that's super interesting. So it's almost kind of um, keeping your keeping your brain sharp with kind of maybe testing yourself with different, um, maybe with different brain games or something, even if it's like naming fruits and vegetables. I think um, that's kind yeah, of- Yeah, I, 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 I didn't say that, but yeah, oh. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Or was that, or is that a trick? Or is that a way to kind of beat the test? No, I, I think, look, I think it goes both way, right? I think if you practice, it's okay. But if you can do it, you're already better anyhow, right? So so what, what comes first? Are you able to do those things because you don't deteriorate it cognitively? Or do you think you're practicing and that's why you can do it? And I think it's both. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's definitely interesting. Um. Let's see. So I, I, I mean, I, I had a 107 year old, actually Helen's brother, the one who was smoker. Yeah. And and he said, the, he, and he he was a head, hedge fund manager. It was his fund when he was 107 years old. Okay. And and I said, why why do you think you're so bright? He said because. I, I read seven different papers. I did the Wall Street Journal and this economy and this, there and there and there. And that's why my brain is trained. And I said, maybe that's the other way around. Maybe you have this brain and that's why you can read the, the papers, right? And it's kind of both probably. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you think, so was he, did he end up, you said he ended up living long, as long as Helen as well? He, li he lived uh, to 100 and a little bit over 108. Wow. Wow, that's very impressive. The, the, they had four siblings that the, the, actually the little sister died when she was 102 and they were all shocked. They couldn't believe it that the little sister died. Like, oh, that's so so it shows you also the genetics, right? It shows you the genetics. How come uh, four siblings that are born to two parents, they're, they're the only, they're, nobody else died. Those four were born between 1910 and 1920 in New York City and all of them passed the age of 102. Wow. Yeah, that's that's super impressive. Um, hopefully one day it'll be kind of commonplace for us to think that like, oh, four siblings can all live to be past 100. Um, I think that's super interesting. Um, so in your book, you had a whole chapter dedicated to cholesterol. Um, so you discuss some of those, the cardioprotective roles of having specific cholesterol levels uh, or potentially, you mentioned four different um, ways that our cholesterol might be protected, um, whether that's having higher HDL cholesterol levels um, lower LDL cholesterol levels or bigger particle size of, of either of those um, and how that might potentially be able to defend against um, against heart disease, which we know um, is one of the most common age-related age diseases that we have. Um, do you think that having specific cholesterol levels are in one's control to improve or do you think um, somebody should maybe opt? We have a lot of questions about if people should opt for a statin, which is usually um, something that people will hear from their doctors. Um, so I'm curious if you think there's any um, specific, I know there might be a genetic component there too, um, but if there's any lifestyle factors that you think would be effective there. Yeah, th there is a genetic uh, factor to increase the good cholesterol. But as you said, you know, increase the good cholesterol is one way to put it. It can decrease the part particle size of the bad cholesterol or increase the particle size of the, bad, of the bad cholesterol. So what's the mechanism? I, I still don't know and, I, and I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I wanna say something about statin. First of all, statins do not change the good cholesterol. Um, statins are not, you know, I'm interested in gerotherapeutics. Those are drugs that you give to animals and they would live healthier and longer. And probably in people, you'll find the same way. If we give statins to animals, they don't live longer or healthier. So this is a drug that's specific for humans and specific to deal with, with the cholesterol because the cholesterol is really very rate limiting to human lifespan. Mice and rats and other animals don't die from coronary disease. So 
statins are absolutely important and uh, there's a way, uh, you know, statins is effective way to do that. But, you know, so, you know, in order to live long, you have to do two things, right? You have to not die <laughs> from heart attack, from cancer, right? That's one mission. And then if you do that, I think we can, we're going to help you a lot to achieve your potential lifespan and health span. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's definitely interesting. It's like, it's funny that that's kind of the criteria, but it, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I would like to ask you a couple of questions about the TAME trial. Um, so you're currently running the TAME trial, targeting aging with metformin. Um, we had some questions about it. So can you describe a bit about what you're investigating there? Um, and then if you can share any recent developments. So uh, uh, the, the reason we're doing TAME trial is very simple. Uh, we think that aging can be targeted and that's that, that, well, we think that aging drives diseases. And if we target aging, we can prevent the diseases. And we want to show the FDA that we can do it. Why? Because if the FDA doesn't approve that, your healthcare providers don't have to pay for you. And if the healthcare providers don't pay for you, then the pharmaceuticals are not going to jump in and develop other drugs, better drugs, combination of drugs, because they need a business claim. So we, and when I say we, is the leaders, the scientific leader of our field, our, our leadership of Gero scientists, um, kind of um, started thinking about it and invented basically the TAME trial. And we went to the FDA and we discussed with the FDA what we're trying to do. And they said, well, if that's what you want to do, we're okay with it. Actually, we had to change some things, but we're okay with it. Okay, so it's about the FDA. The drug that we're using, the tool that we're using is a really very potent drug for, a, for, for gerotherapeutic. It's called metformin. It's a very common uh, drug. Um, uh, I, I, I believe that many of the people who are viewing now are on, on metformin because it's a common drug, it's a safe drug, it's generic, it's very cheap. In fact, although it's used for diabetes, uh, it was used in the, in the 1920s and 50s to prevent flu and, and malaria and inflammatory disease. And by the way, as an anecdote there, nine studies around the world that metformin prevented hospitalization and death from COVID. And even a, a few weeks ago, New England Journal of Medicine that gave metformin and some other drugs that didn't work for people three days into COVID and it prevented hospitalization and death by, by about 50%. Okay, so what I'm saying is, yeah, at that time they noticed that it lowers uh, uh, glucose in diabetics and it became this diabetic pill, but actually it's not. It's a gero, uh, gero therapeutic that really targets all the biology of aging and increase health span and lifespan in animals. And in different studies in human have shown already, it will prevent diabetes and cardiovascular disease and cancer and, and cognitive decline and Alzheimer and death. You know, people, people on metformin, diabetics on metformin have half the mortality. Of, of, of people without mortality it has nothing to do with their glucose control. So we have all this evidence, we just may have to make it formal because, because otherwise we don't accelerate and we don't start blocking aging and we should do it now. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. And it's, um, it's interesting that you think it's, it, so you think it's independent uh, or the actions of metformin um, are kind of independent of that um, of the impact of glucose when it comes to longevity. Yeah, I I think there there are some direct mechanism. You know, it's just funny that when I came first to the United States, I, I was a fellow at Yale in 1987, and and metformin was not in the United States yet, but I was in a lab where my job was to determine the mechanism of action of metformin on diabetes. And, and part of it is a direct effect because it lowers insulin, okay? And that's why, you know, it improves glucose. But, but uh, uh, the, the, some of the effects even on diabetes are on the aging part. 
and not necessarily on the diabetes part. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's interesting to think about. Um, so kind of going off of some of those markers, so you mentioned um, glucose, and then we've been talking a bit about cholesterol too. Um, are there any particular biomarkers that you recommend that somebody monitor um, over their lifetime to help to improve their health span or lifespan? Um, well, the answer for that is stay tuned because I'm actually very busy in working on, on biomarkers. So it's a, it's a little bit more complicated than we're used to, right? Because an example for a biomarker is cholesterol, okay? Cholesterol is a biomarker. It predicts that you, you're at risk for heart disease. But also it's the mechanism. If you lower cholesterol, you're going to prevent the heart disease. Uh, blood pressure is a risk for heart disease and stroke. If you lower blood pressure, pressure you in aging, we have more sophisticated biomarkers. And, um, and we are trying to now identify them in an omics way. When I say omics way, we're doing, you know, I'm, I'm working now with 5,000 proteins on 1,000 people trying to understand what's their aging part. So we're, we're working on, on big studies on many omics in order to determine maybe the 10 that, that matters. It, it'll be more than 10 because although I said that aging is mutual to all of our organs, um, we might identify which organ is going to fail first from aging. So it, it is possible that we'll have more biomarkers and more specific biomarkers, but we're not totally yet there. Although if you guys are interested, you can go up and purchase, you know, their methylation, their clocks, what we call, you can purchase them. They haven't been proven. Let's put it this way. They have been proven to be associated with disease and death, but, but we don't know which change and change fast when you do something, right? Because, okay, it's one thing to know your biological age compared to your chronological age. And we know that we are, you look at your class and you know, or not, not uh, uh, Michelle, not your class, but your parents' class. <laughs> and you kind of see all of a sudden, some people look younger than others, okay? So the chronological age and biological age is one thing, but, if you have a biological age that is old and you need to exercise and eat better and lose weight and maybe take drugs, what are the biomarkers that you have to follow? Okay, and, and we're not there yet. Although they're commercially available, we don't bless them yet or the FDA doesn't bless them yet. That's Yeah, that's interesting. And I think um, I, if I were to kind of summarize that, are you kind of saying that there are specific biomarkers that we know um, are maybe associated with preventing disease, preventing diseases that we know are age related, and is that just kind of the difference between biomarkers that can prevent age related diseases and then biomarkers that might be associated with, like, with proper aging or healthy aging itself? Right, okay. right, right. So we we're looking at so we have this population between uh, sixty five and ninety five, and we're asking, okay, what changes in this population in those five thousand proteins? Okay. And it's interesting because half of our population, as, as I discuss in our book, half of our population are the children of centenarians. Okay, they're the same age. Sometimes they're married to each other, but one has longevity in the family and the other doesn't. And they're basically 10 years younger, but also their proteins are 10 years younger. You know, if, if the, uh, our control without longevity have 580 proteins that change, uh, our offspring have only 200 that changes. Wait 10 years and they, they'll be the same, but you can see how those proteins can, uh, uh, can, can predict, uh, uh, will be able to predict uh, biological age and treatment, more important. Wow. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think um, that's an interesting place that kind of the biological aging field is going towards. Um, that's super interesting. Um, a question that we get quite often from from our audience is, is it ever either too late to start um, thinking about my health and longevity, or is it ever too early to start thinking about my health and longevity? Um, I'm curious if you have any thoughts. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So look, um, let's divide it to, let's say that we're doing pretty well until we're 50. You know, some people are not doing so well when 
pair 40, but let, let's just pick 50. And in 50, we're trying to break down, okay? And, and so there, after the age of 50, there are mechanisms of aging. Those mechanisms of aging are not stopping, okay? So it's never too late to, to treat. In fact, most of our trials now are on uh, animals that are the equivalent of 60, 65 years in human, okay? We're not doing it from where they start. So that's one thing. The second thing, and that worries me a bit, is some of the things we're in inventing and finding might not be safe to younger people be below the age of 50. So Take, for example, metformin. All the data in metformin we have are basically trials that took people over the, the age of 50. Although metformin is given, obese people sometimes get metformin, women with PCSO get metformin. There, there are some other indication, but most of our trial are over the age of 50. Now, one of the things that metformin does actually, not always, but often enough, it lowers one of the growth hormones, okay? So I said, it's great when you're old to lower the growth hormone. But when you're young, I don't think it's good. So you shouldn't get uh, metformin before that. Uh, the study, the TAME, what TAME is going to do is going to take people between 65 and, and 79. So we are already taking people who are old. In fact, we, we, we don't want people who are going to be centenarians who are healthy now. So we have to see something that's happening and we have data on metformin that, yeah, it's never too late to start treating it. But, 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 and by the way, we age from the minute we're conceived, we're aged, but it's a little bit different mechanism, probably is going to be a little bit different treatment. Right. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, it's interesting to see how that um, maybe it might, might differ, like what somebody might do to help to help to um, build healthy habits or help to prevent or delay aging it might be different um, depending on how old they are currently. Um, so I think that's always important. All right, we have a number of questions in the chat um, for you. So let's, um, let's see, um, it's interesting. So we have a question about sleep, which we haven't touched on um, at all. Is there any kind of relationship that you've seen? Um, maybe do centenarians tend to like, maybe they take naps or do they sleep a full, that full eight hours? Or do you have, do you have any research to support, um, sleep? Yeah. So when, when we started going to centenarians, I asked people, what do you think I should ask centenarians? And I think the most common, uh, answer that I got, oh, sleep, maybe they're napping, you know, maybe nap is really what get you there. So I went to this, first centenarians and yeah, I asked him a question. Then I said, are you napping? He said, yeah, I'm napping. Oh God, I said, I'm, I'm up to something. So ah, you're napping, so you're napping every day? He said, pretty much every nap. And, and when you wake up, you're okay? He said, when I wake up, I'm okay. So I'm saying, that's great. So, so like last year, he said, no, last year I wasn't napping. And the year before, yeah, I was napping. So, okay, they, they're hundred years old. First of all, they don't remember <laughs> <laughs> if napping was part or not. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're napping now, you know, people who are napping, most of the elderly that are napping is because they don't sleep well at night. Okay. okay? That's why they're napping. It's not the nap of siesta. Okay. We go, <laughs> we have lunch, we sleep, and then we go on. So the only Im important thing that we found really is that sleep lower sleep by the way centenarians sleep eight hours a day on average which is pretty good but the the only uh, but but many centenarians have sleep disturbances as as well as their children as and as well as our control population but when you have sleep disturbances you get a lot of other abnormalities metabolic abnormalities you tend to be sick more and our centenarians are the children are protected from that <laughs> okay so it's not so sleep is not leading their longevity but the fact they have longevity protects them if they have sleep disturbances yeah that's that's interesting too because it's like because we know that sleep is tied to so many different processes and and functions and things in the body so no that it makes a lot of sense and, that and, and, and i i should add look what, what should we do with sleep? Because it's difficult, you know? So, okay, so some people don't sleep because they party all night and 
then they have to wake up in the morning. Okay, so the answer is no, you have to sleep, okay? Uh, other people are, we're dying to sleep, but we don't fall asleep, right? So the, the, the point is you have to go and be eight hours in a dark room without your electronic, <laughs> without uh, beeping, without light, and just try to stay asleep, okay? If you succeed six and a half hours, it's better than if you, you know, don't do it with a purpose. So, uh, so, and, and, you know, the drugs are, you know, melatonin helps some, some, but the drugs, most of the drugs can put you to sleep, but not to a good quality sleep, not with the REM and the deep sleep that we want. Okay. So it sounds like there's a couple of tips here. So we, so it's dark room. Um, and then maybe like limiting that screen time um, to be able to not have some of that bright light as well. Um, so that, yeah, those are, I think those are some good tangible tips to improve sleep. Um, and then we have another question. I think this one's interesting um, about kind of the, when we're looking at cholesterol levels, um, is there any, I, I know there's a, um, some more research lately on ApoB. Um, do you happen to happen to have any thoughts on if that one is, um, is effective to measure um, in relation to heart health? Uh, Apple B, I think, is the only thing that makes sense to measure. I, I think the others are not directly answering. You know, Apple B answers how many particles. B by the way, there, there's an, one exception, but Apple B is really telling you how many bad cholesterol particles are there. So, yeah, it's a good question. I don't think it's mainstream. It takes time to move this big boat that has been floating, but Applebee is a good measurement. Thank you for, I mean, I didn't expect this, somebody to say that, but yes. Yeah, no, that is a great question. And that's good to hear that there's, um, and it's it's nice that it sounds like there's like, you think it's like that one marker that people should, um, should look at. So that's um, very right. interesting. We had another question about resveratrol for longevity. Um, if you have any, any thoughts on resveratrol or any other supplements um, with longevity. So let me tell you that. So I, I actually did a study on resveratrol, it took elderly, gave them resveratrol up to five grams. I mean, you know, usually people take maybe 600 milligrams or hundred milligrams, you know, much lower dose. And I really didn't show any impressive uh, effect. And I don't think that we think resveratrol uh, on its own is sufficient to do some something important to many uh, people. Look, the supplements, so this is what I used to say, may, maybe it's in my book, I don't know how I wrote it in the book, but I said, the nice thing about the supplement, they're good for the economy, okay? So yeah, we're supporting to the economy. And as long as they don't have what they claim they have, or, uh, or, or you know, if they're if they're safe, <laughs> if they're safe and not doing harm, then I don't care. What I've noticed recently that supplements have become better biologically. Okay, there's lots of supplementation that it's not that who knows what's in the bottle. The bottles are potent, and people are using them together, and this is extremely extremely dangerous. We we know of. Uh, cases where we looked at some of those biomarkers for aging and people started taking those 31 supplements and their age increased by nine years, not decreased. Oh. Now, I don't know, maybe the test is not right, but I believe that the supplements can be potent and dangerous in particular in combination. Uh, so I would, I would warn people against uh, uh, supplements um, and, you know, there's very little supplements that, that uh, we need, you know, vi vitamin D is an example because I'm sure most of the viewers are on vitamin D because, because that's, that's how we measure and that's what we do. Now, those of you who have osteoporosis, then yeah, vitamin D is absolutely good, but vitamin D, low vitamin D is associated with lots of other diseases. And when you supplement them and look at those diseases in big studies, nothing happened, okay? So, so even, even those things like vitamin D are, you can take them, but they're doing nothing. 
Uh, but some of them can be also dangerous. So I, I'm just, I, for me, it's a big warning sign. And, and you know, there, there's another point here. Poco, you, you know, Mars, the candy bar, Mars? Yeah. So Mars is a company that actually did a clinical study. In the clinical study, they took 20,000 people and supplied them with cocoa powder or placebo. Okay, people didn't know, same flavor. People didn't know what they're having. The people on powder had less heart disease and less mortality and some other things. So here is a nutraceutical that they cannot write on their Mars candy bar that this will prevent cardiovascular disease because by law, nutraceuticals cannot do it. And we, are, we want to approach the FDA and say, you know what, a lot of the supplements that are for aging, okay, we want companies to do that and study that. We need this. And we think that companies that are doing clinical studies should get to say what they found in their clinical studies. So I, I think this is something, and I think this Mars, it's called, by the way, uh, Cosmos, it's the Cosmos trial. You, you, you can look for it, but the Cosmos trial was really amazing. And, and that, that's my official thing. If, if supplement have not shown in a clinical study to be effective, then I don't think you should take it. There are those NAD supplement, NMN and R, I, I don't know, some of you might know, haven't, haven't shown to work yet. And may, maybe there is a reason for that. So yeah, you can spend a lot of money, you can take it. I'm not sure it's dangerous, but it hasn't been working. We want people to show that it works. Yeah, I think kind of going along the lines of what you said about kind of nutraceuticals or um, different things that are proven to show that they can help with aging. I think there are maybe some foods that can potentially do that and maybe be a little bit more safe potentially than certain supplements. Um, I'm curious if there's any um, specific foods or where you kind of rank, maybe where you rank diet um, in terms of like, kind of promoting longevity and if there's any specific foods or dietary pattern that you um, that you think would be beneficial. Michelle, that's your job. <laughs> what, what, what do you want me to do? Tell, you know, what do you think? You know, I, ask me if I agree with you, but yeah. you know, it's not, it's not right. It's not my research, right? It's not my research, but <laughs> um, the, 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 the only thing I, I would say, which is my research really is not what kind of food, but the fasting part of food. And that's what a lot of us are doing, intermittent fasting. So let me tell you, and I describe it in the book, but you know, caloric restriction was a way to get animals to live much longer. We took brothers, half of them ate whatever they want. The others got 60% of that. Those that got 60%, they lived healthier. They lived much longer, 40%, okay? Really quite incredible. And people took it to say, you see, you need to eat less for breakfast, less for lunch, less for dinner, always leave something in your plate. But that's not what we've done. We would bring the food in the morning to those animals that are hungry. And they would eat all the food in 20 minutes and then they were fasting for 23 hours. If we give them the food throughout the day, so they're, it's not caloric restriction and fasting. If we give the same food throughout the day, they are leaner, but they don't live much longer. Okay, that's how we discovered that fasting is really an important thing. And a lot of us, you, you know, geroscientists, but they'll tell you what kind of intermittent fasting they're doing. I'm, I'm, I'm watching when I ended up to have dinner, if it was eight o'clock at night, I'm not eating anything. I'm drinking coffee without milk and sugar, but I'm not eating anything until noontime, at least. And that's every day. And it gets, it gets easier and you start feeling better. You're losing, men are losing weight more than, it's not for weight, it's for aging. Okay, so men are losing, I, I lost like eight pounds with that. Uh, women are losing on, on average less. But from an aging perspective, this has been something that was, um, that is important um, uh, uh, to, to realize. And and uh, there, there's other things that happen that you feel you feel good. And by the way, I'm 100 years old, right? I'm I'm doing okay. <laughs> not quite, not quite. <laughs> yeah. 
Not quite well or not quite 100? What do you mean? <laughs> not quite 100. <laughs> um, a question for you too. So um, what are you most excited about um, that's coming up next for you? So what are you currently working on? Um, anything that you're particularly excited about? Um, yes. So there are three things that are uh, happening. And now I'm talking about, you, did, you didn't mention it, but I'm the scientific director of the American Federation of Aging Research. So uh, there are three projects that I kind of initiated and I'm kind of working them. By the way, one of them is ten. Okay, so we talked we talked about that. Uh, American Federation of Aging Research (AFR) is uh, doing the TAME trial. The second one is uh, an initiative that uh, will be published very soon. It's called the Super Ager Initiative. So we have seven hundred fifty centenarians, and they're unique from a genetic perspective, and you know, blah blah, lots of stuff you you can read in the book. But, and we can find longevity genes, but we want to find all the longevity genes that are possible. And for that, we need 10,000 more centenarians. So we have an initiative that rather than work, it's still from Einstein, but rather than work the way we are working, we got the, we got the community of centenarians to register to the American Federation of Aging Research and we'll send them kits so that they can have saliva and send us their uh, their DNA, and we can get them and one of their children and one of you know, who's married to the child or somebody who reflects the same ethnic uh, group uh, to a study that will be just amazing of how much we can discover that is really uh, go going to be cool. So that's really the next stage up, up upgrading the, the research that we have done because we proved um, that it was very fruitful. The second thing has to do with biomarkers and we call it uh, the FAST initiative and FAST stands mainly for FAST. The initials are, we're looking at uh, uh, studies that, so I, I, don't, I don't remember, the, <laughs> but we're looking at studies that were already done. For example, there was a study where um, people over the age of 50 got metformin or lifestyle intervention with diet and caloric restriction. And we're going to take plasma from this study and do the biomarkers now. There are studies with a new drug that is an SGLT2 inhibitor, also a gerotherapeutic, and we're going and, and getting those plasma now so that in a short time, we can get ahead with those biomarkers and, and really work them. So, you know, the point is, if we're going to have lots of drugs to target aging, we don't want like TAME to do a five-year study every time and it costs a lot of money. We want a small study that in several months you'll have biomarkers and you'll know that you're on the right way, okay? So that's what we're trying to do. So, so that's it, the super aging, the biomarker and TAME is what I'm spending a lot of my time in, in doing. Wow, it sounds like you're busy with a lot of these um, different aging initiatives and different studies. So yeah, they're very interesting. And we'll have to have you back um, to chat about some of those results. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, so much for being here today. Um, I know our audience um, was so excited to be able to ask you their questions and um, I was so excited to speak with you as well. So thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure and, and that was fun, Michelle, and good luck to you and, and uh, we'll be in touch. Awesome. Thank you so much.